How many of you are shocked that we're in November? I feel like 2020 just started. No, it's about to start. It's around the corner. 2019 is almost at a close. Last night we turned, turned back our clocks. I love that extra hour of sleep, but my wife showed me a meme. I wish I had it here for you, but daylight savings for new parents, it really means nothing. <laughs> but for the rest of you, I hope you enjoyed your extra hour of sleep. So we're in November. This means the holiday season is almost here. How many of you are excited? By now, some of you have started brushing up on your Thanksgiving recipes. Some of you have started planning your holiday parties. And some of you overachievers, yes, some of you overachievers have already started shopping for Christmas. And uh, for the rest of you, I just probably gave you a little bit of heartburn telling you all these things. Holiday season's almost here. You're not alone, though. You don't have heartburn all by yourself because I'm right there with you. I'm going to speak for myself, and I just want to be candid with you this morning and just be real. When I start thinking about all the food I'm going to eat, when I start thinking about all the gatherings and everyone saying, come to my house, we're going to have this party, that party, and I got this one here, that one there. When I start thinking about the decorations and how everything inside of my house is going to change, and, and now I bought a house, I'm hoping my wife is not get the, going to get the idea of having me go put lights outside. Please, no, please don't, please don't. But anyways, when I start thinking about all the preparations for the holidays, just thinking about it makes me tired. <laughs> Just thinking about it's making me tired. You know, to think the fact that during this time of year, I have to add all these things on top of my already full calendar. You know, that we have to cram in like two or three extra things every single day or every single weekend on top of everything we already do. Yay. <laughs> Maybe it's just this tiredness in me speaking this morning. See, for the last six months, the Feria household has been a flurry. There's been a lot of things. And uh, adjusting to our new snoozeless alarm clock, Micah, has strengthened the affections between my wife and I for our pillows. We love our pillows all the more now. And when we can go away and have a date with that pillow, it's just amazing. So I just got to say, I'm tired. I feel tired. And I don't know, I imagine some of you have probably experienced the same around this time of year, around this season, when you're just plain tired. Someone says holidays, and yes, it's the time of joy and happiness and excitement, but it's also a time of great weariness, and we get tired. It's a lot to do. And so fatigue occasionally overtakes the best of us. Am I in the right place? Does it take over the best of us at times? I think even the strongest, the most dedicated, the most on fire people, the ones who have it all together and are really on top of their schedules, I think fatigue slithers in every once in a while. Whether it's physical or mental, sometimes we're just overtaken by the physical and mental fatigue stemming from just doing our regular day-to-day -day routines, you know, making sure our ends meet. We put long hours at work so that we can put food on the table. We're barely able to catch a breath as we jump from one activity, one freshly completed, completed project to the next because that to-do list, it doesn't seem to get shorter. It's always, we're always adding to it. You know, we, we shuffle between soccer practice and music lessons and martial arts and gymnastics and every other activity under the sun that is deemed to be beneficial for our child's future prospects. And we're jumping around, chasing all these things. And when we're feeling an inkling of courage and boldness, sometimes we even try to, you know, tackle a hobby. You know, something just to keep our sanity, something that we love to do just because it's like, I need to get away and I need to do this to make me feel okay and sane and all right. And in all this activity, trying to fit it all in, we forgo enough sleep, we neglect to exercise, and then we often choose pizza. Yeah. Amen. Amen, hallelujah. 
We can do a great deal of harm to our bodies, though, this time of year, if we're not careful. You know, the physical burdens, the physical, mental, you know, dedication and everything we're chasing. If we're not careful, we're going to be left exhausted. It could also be emotional. Sometimes the fatigue is emotional in nature. And what do I mean? We wrestle with draining dysfunctional relationships. Because you know what? Let's admit it. We can't pick all of the relationships we have. And some of them are really not that edifying. Or we don't leave the conversation feeling, man, I, that was awesome. Sometimes we leave conversations and our heart is broken. You know, we look at, at actions that people take and we're like, why? And it's just frustrating. And so it could be that. Maybe sometimes we grapple with our circumstances, a living with a tension of unrealized dreams. And so that, that weighs us down. That makes us emotionally tired. And at times we cope with heartbreaking loss. We're praying for a lot of people, by the way, who are going through some difficult situation. But sometimes the solutions aren't there the way that we want them. And it's difficult. See, these situations and many others um, pile on worry, anxiety, stress. And did you know, I, you know, I've often heard stress is, is a killer. Stress can cause us harm and all that. But in 2005, a group of Australian scientists actually discovered, they said that if, if, if you're going through a season and a period of emotional exhaustion, you're emotionally stressed, your body actually produces a hormone, all right? It's a weird scientific name. It's called neuropeptide Y, N-P-Y for short. This hormone is released in your bloodstream, and what it does, it goes all throughout your body, and it inhibits the cells in your immune system that goes against and tries to fight pathogens, that tries to fight the things that are going to make you sick. So these hormones inhibit them from working. So stress has been proven to actually make us sick. It literally makes us sick. How many of y'all have met some people who, who they were stressed out and sick beyond belief? I had a professor in college that uh, before he became a professor, he was the CEO of a company, and his doctor said to him one day, you need to have a change. He's like, you got to stop drinking. He's like, I don't drink. He's like, you, 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 need to, you, you need to stop doing this or that. And he's like, I don't do that. He's like, man, what do you do? He's like, well, I'm a CEO of a company. He's like, well, you know what? You got to change your job or you're going to be dead in like five years. Stress is a killer. Emotional burdens can really cause us harm. Or maybe for some of us, you know, we go through seasons of life where we're just spiritually tired, spiritually drained. And that can take a toll on the body as well because we are a triune in nature. We're a mind, body, and soul, right? And so, Maybe some of us are struggling with the, the weight of, of sin and the tension and the struggle that when it comes and it overwhelms and we're just trying to lead a life in light of sin, in light of grappling with the temptations. There is a weirdness in trying to live a good life on our own strength and not depending on the Lord. And so we fail time and time again and time and time again. And every time we fail, we start feeling more and more down. More and more tired, more and more exhausted because we're just not able to carry the burden. It leaves us feeling broken, leaves us feeling powerless, unworthy, and distant. If left unchecked, spiritual fatigue can affect an entire generation. Just look at the nation of Israel after the Exodus. After they left Egypt, that spiritual burden of failing again and again, uh, doing the wrong things one, all the time, of never being able to fulfill because they're just not getting it. They're, they're weeding out the slavery mindset. It caused the whole nation to say, can we just go back there? <laughs> I can't. I'm too tired. Let's go back to Egypt. If left unchecked, it can break our resolve to move on. So our weariness results in the accumulation of all these intersections. It's, it's something complex. And you know what? Sometimes we get irritated because people come up to us and say, hey, cheer up. It's going to be okay. You know, and, and sometimes just cheer up. It's going to be okay does not help. It doesn't really solve the issue. But you know what? I found that a simple promise, a simple promise can relieve a very complex burden provided 
that we believe in the power behind that promise. Provided that the power behind that promise is complex and strong enough to relieve our heaviness. And so I am so grateful for this book called the Bible. Because I believe that God has left us many, many promises. And the good news is that Jesus foresaw our battle with fatigue. He foresaw our battle with being tired, and especially in the holiday seasons. And so he left us a promise. So I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew chapter 20. I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 11. And we're going to start in verse 28. Once you're there, I want to hear a mighty amen. That way I know when I can keep going. All right, there's a few of us ready to go. I want us to take a look at this passage here, Matthew 11, verse 28. And I want to explore the promise a little bit today. Just a few things. We're not going to go too deep, but just a few things. Are we there? All right, I'm reading out of the NIV. Then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens. And I will give you rest. Such a simple promise. Jesus, I thank you for your words. And I pray that they would be life in our bodies. That they would change us from the inside out. In your precious name. Amen. That day while speaking to a crowd of religious leaders. In earshot of a lot of people who were tired and weary. There's a lot of things happening here. But in that moment, Jesus says something so plain and so simple. He gives a simple invitation. He says, come to me. I want you to notice, he didn't say, come to a ritual. He didn't say, come to a church. We say that a lot. Hey, come to church. Hey, come to a religion. No, no, no. He said something so matter of fact. He said something so simple and so easy. It said, Don't, it doesn't matter what your burden is. It doesn't matter what you're facing. It doesn't matter how tired and weary you are. All it is, the simple invitation applies to one, applies to all, and it is, come to me and I'll give you rest. It's a simple invitation. The simplicity of his promise is both striking and it's invigorating. We're going to get into that a little bit. Jesus doesn't offer us the five pillars of peace as submission to Islam does. Jesus doesn't prescribe us a fourfold path that will lead us into enlightenment and peace like the Buddha did. Nor does he give us the pragmatic, some of you younger millennials, BuzzFeed type list, okay? How many have been on BuzzFeed? There's like lists for everything. You know, top five reasons for this, 20 reasons for that. This is how you do this. Jesus doesn't give us a BuzzFeed list of seven ways you can relieve your tiredness. He doesn't do that. Jesus simply offers himself. He says, hey, are you tired? Are you weary? Are you burdened? Hey, I offer you myself. I offer you myself as the universal answer to all that burdens you. That's, that's a very bold statement. It's simple, but I want us to not lose sight of how bold this is. Think about that. Jesus is speaking in the midst of leaders, leaders who have a track record of making every single thing that they say and do very complicated, very complex. And it seems that sometimes we feel for something to be legitimate, it has to be complicated. The more complex it is, the probably the better it is. You know, it's kind of like the mindset, oh, the, the more expensive it is, the better it is for me. Uh, not necessarily. Not necessarily. If, if that was the case, Primark would be out of business, all right? And Primark's a good place. You can get a lot of clothes for little money. So, what's the point? It's a very bold statement. If just any single person or anyone else had made this promise, we might find it empty. How many of us have, have heard empty promises before all right don't tell me who made it but how many of us have heard it you know if this promise hey come to me and I'll give you rest if this came from a politician how would you react you know what if this came from a physician we, we might be like yeah I want to believe you but if it had come from any other person we would have taken it with a grain of salt 
okay, let me see what you mean. It's like when you see these ads, like how can they get away with saying the things that they say? Oh, they can get away with it because in the fine print, there's a disclaimer how to qualify that statement. And technically, it's still truth, but yet it's not the whole truth. See, take my wife, for instance. We were sick a little while ago, and she got sick first, and I got sick, and, and, and the kids coughing. It was just craziness. But in that period of time, I had a fever. And although my wife loves me so much, right, honey? That would have been your cue to say amen, well, hallelujah. All right, so even though she loves me so much, she might want me to be well. She does want me to be well. She doesn't want to see me sick. And, and, but there are certain things that my wife just can't do for me. See, she, she could give me the medicine for the fever, which she did. She could prescribe me other remedies, like go take a, a, a cold bath to be able to, you know, try to regulate your body temperature and all that kind of stuff, or tell me all these other advices. She could pray for me and intercede and rebuke the fever, which she did, absolutely no problem with that. But you know what? She can't set my body temperature. My wife just cannot set my body temperature. She can't change that. That's totally outside of her control. See, there are some things that other people just cannot do for us, period. Now, here comes Jesus, and he says, hey, are you tired? Are you weary? Are you burdened? Are you feeling overwhelmed? Hey, just come to me, and I'll give you rest. Come to me, and I'll give you rest. Stop for a second and notice these words, all. The invitation is extended to all who are troubled. All means the invitation is universal. None of the troubled are omitted. I want you to stop and think about that. He was speaking thousands of years ago, and how many millions and billions of people have come through this earth since the days he was speaking this promise? How many people did he not yet see personally and meet personally in the sense of dialoguing with them and meeting them and seeing their issue? Think of how bold this statement is. Sight unseen, without taking inventory of all the possible problems that would ever come down the pipeline, Jesus says, come to me all. That's bold. That's bold. Some, have, you ever, have you ever had somebody show up to you and say, hey, can you, can you do this for me? Sometimes people show up and they, they'll say, hey, pastor, say yes, okay? Uh, some of you are laughing. You know I'm talking about you. Love you, though. Love you. Hey, pastor, just say yes, okay? And then they start proceeding to tell me what it is. And I love it. I love it because there's, there's this, we're going to partner. We're going to do things together. It's going to be fun. You know, there's probably what I'm sharing is going to be in line with what, who you are because they know me, so it's all right. But have you ever had people show up and say, just say yes? It's like your kids show up, daddy, say yes. And then they, they tell you what they want. We want a puppy. So before... Before we say yes at times, we're, we're cautious. We want to know what are we about to commit to? Will we be able to do that which the person is asking of us? And here comes Jesus and says, hey, all, come to me. He does not care to find out what it means and what it's going to entail. Jesus just says, all of you who are troubled, I don't care what it is, you come to me. That is bold. Can someone give him a praise for that? That is bold. <laughs> Secondly, he says, I. I want you to stop and think about that. It's so bold. All can come. But then he says, I will give you rest. Now, I stop and I think about that. Sometimes I want to do something and say, I'm going to do this. But I'm like, I definitely can't do that. And Jesus says, I will give you rest. He doesn't say, my father will give you rest. Think of how awesome that is. There is an echo of Jeremiah 31, 25 here, which says, for I satisfy the weary ones and refresh everyone who languishes. Back when Yahweh refreshed his people through a new covenant with them, that was Jeremiah 31. God promised, God says, I'm going to give you refreshing. Now, here comes Jesus and says, I'm showing up with a new covenant, and I'm going to refresh you. It won't even, I don't even have to ask my daddy because I have the power to do that. I'm going to do it for you. That is bold. He's not depending on the power of his dad, but he's depending on who he is. Because you know what? 
Only a person who is who he says he is can make such a promise like this. And Jesus is demonstrating that he is the son of the all-living God, that he is the word made flesh. Hebrews 1, 1 through 3 says, In the last days he meaning God, has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. We just sang, in him are all things, and to him are all things. He deserves the glory, the Son, Jesus Christ. I will give you rest. It goes on to say, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful words. So he says, come to me, all who are weary. I will give you rest, everyone included. I am the one who does it. And now here's the meaning. See, sometimes we we, we come to church and there's all these Christianese words, right? You know, we use these words that you don't really hear the world using outside. We talk about righteousness a lot. We talk about atonement. We talk about, you know, salvation and da-da-da-da and all these different things. So he says, come to me. And what does that mean? The power comes here in understanding what this means because it makes it so practical for us. The invitation is practical. When he says, come to me, what is Jesus saying? If you look at the context of this chapter, chapter 11, if you look at chapter 12, the one right next to it, Jesus leans into those who have opposed him. He's speaking to religious leaders who have at every single turn rejected what he's doing. He's speaking to people who are not believing who he says he is. They refuse to believe him. Jesus rebukes the cities in which he went to do miracles in. Hey, woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Capernaum. Woe to you, and so on and so forth. He starts speaking to the Pharisees. You did not believe who I said I am. And that's why I could not do mighty miracles among you. He starts rebuking the Pharisees. And even though these people caught glimpses, they saw his power, they saw his miracles, even though they had a tangible encounter with Jesus, they still chose to not believe in who he was. They still didn't put their trust in him. And so, plainly, when Jesus says, come to me, here's what he's saying, church. He's saying, believe in who I claim to be and therefore what I am able to do for you. They weren't getting it. The question for us this morning is, will we believe? The invitation is, are you tired? Come to me. Will we believe that he can give us rest? That's the invitation, and that's the simplicity of it. That's the boldness of it. He's going to provide it, but he's offering for us only himself, nothing else. He's not offering us a strategy. He's not offering us a humongous business plan. He's just sharing himself. And you know what? Here's the challenge for me and you in that. Sometimes we want to know the how and the when, and all Jesus is offering is himself. He's only offering the who. Is the who enough for you, or do you care about the how? Is the who enough for you, or do you worry about the when? Jesus says, receive the who, which is me, and I will give you rest. He wants our soul to rest in the surety that he will keep his promise. Because he is a promise keeper. Second thing I see in this passage as we look in this season of weariness and tiredness, no matter what we feel, is that Jesus gives us a challenging prescription. Now, I want you to ask ask you this question. How do you guys envision rest? All right? Think about the word rest. What image comes to your mind? The first thing that pops in my mind is a hammock. That is definitely not me right there, but I would love to be where she's at right now. I don't know where that is, but I will love that. For me, when I picture rest, I picture taking a nap on my couch because there's something magical about the couch that's different than the bed. I don't know, like it's such a deeper sleep or something. I don't know what happens. I wake up not feeling as great because it's not as, you know, ergonomically good for my back, but whatever. When I think of rest, I think of listening to the leaves rustle as I'm laying in the hammock. When I think about rest, I think about reading a mystery novel on the beach with the sound of the waves and the sand in my toes. Amen, hallelujah, I got some beach people right here, awesome. That's what I think about when I think about rest. Now I want you to picture rest in whatever way it is. Maybe for some of you is someone else takes the kids and you have the day for yourself. (laughs) That's all it is, You you don't need a beach, you don't need a hammock, you don't need nothing. You just need some quiet. 
Okay. See, we seek rest by escaping. We seek rest by getting away and relieving ourselves of responsibility. If I can just get the responsibility off my shoulders, I'll be at peace. And yet, here's Jesus' surprising next words. Ready? Verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. With Jesus, rest is not a promise to the retired. Rest is not a promise to the retired. Instead, he calls us to a new task. When it comes to resting in Jesus, he says, I got a new job for you. I got a new project for you. While we're looking for a hammock, Jesus gives us a yoke. Jesus, give me some rest. Okay, here you go. Put on this yoke. What's a yoke? I think we have a picture somewhere in there. Put up the yoke for us. For those of us who are not farmers and we don't live in agricultural context, a yoke is simply an instrument of labor. It's an instrument made up of a wooden beam that has harnesses for two oxen. This yoke, this beam is placed across the back of the ox. It's right on its shoulders and then it's harnessed around their necks. The yoke was attached to a long perpendicular post, a wooden beam. And it usually was attached to a plow. And hold, the whole purpose of this yoke is to harness the power of the oxen so that the work for the man, for the farmer, is made a lot more bearable. It was the whole purpose is to make the man more efficient, more effective, more productive. And he could plow the field so much better with the ox as opposed to just plowing them by himself. And so that's the plan. It's for productivity. It's for the release of burden. And so usually the two oxen, they were united together. You're not having just one. You're having two of them going in tandem. It's one yoke between two of them. The farmer would usually pair up a more experienced, more mature ox with a less experienced, younger ox. And so as they come together and they're doing this work, the mature ox is stronger. He knows the route. He's more mature. He's, he's got experience. He knows where he's going, and he starts leading, whereas the novice is completely clueless. The younger ox just wants to go wherever he wants to go. He wants to do whatever he wants to do. He doesn't want to go to work. He just wants to go grace. And yet, while they're bound under the same yoke, the mature ox bears the weight of the yoke, and he's just moving it along. And the cool thing is that the younger ox, the immature one, the one who's just gaining experience, he doesn't feel the weight of the yoke, but he feels the constraint of trusting his more experienced partner. There's a constraint there. There's a tension there that he's feeling, but it's not the weight. It's, I got to trust. The young ox would wander and go off his path and do whatever he wants, but the yoke would constantly bring him back into where he needs to go. So do you see the picture of the yoke there? These two happy guys are doing their jobs. Here's the significance. When Jesus says to the people who are tired, who are weary, he says, hey, take up my yoke. What he's teaching us is the real cause of fatigue. He's teaching us the nature of true rest. The problem with our lives is not that we must work or that we must serve some master. That's not the issue. Or that we must perform some task. That's not the problem. The problem really is what work do we do and whom do we choose to serve? What Jesus is saying, he's saying, take up my yoke and learn from me. He's saying, let me lead your life. Let me lead you and direct you. Let me steer you in the place to place, in the places you should be, in the places you should go, follow me. Come, invitation. And now he says, I got a challenge. Take up my yoke. Follow me. While the Pharisees were imposing their own heavy yokes, they're they're saying, you got to do this and that and this law and abide by this rule in order for you to be saved. The same thing happened in the book of Acts when the Holy Spirit poured down and he came upon the Gentiles. The same exact thing happened. The Gentiles are starting to come to faith. They're starting to believe in Jesus. They're starting to have their faith and God is pouring out his spirit upon them. What does the the church in Jerusalem do? They convene a council and they're starting to say, well, we got to tell them to do this. Well, they have to be circumcised. They have to follow these dietary laws. They have to do this. They have to do that. And Peter says, whoa, 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 hold up. Guys, 
The Holy Spirit is poured out on them. God is accepting them to come. God is saying faith in me is enough. And so why are we going to put rules on them and yokes on them that we ourselves would never able to fulfill completely? The point is, the Pharisees are putting on all these rules, and yet Jesus is saying something simple. Just, hey, come to me, follow me. To be a follower of Jesus, it is to be a disciple of Jesus. What does that mean? That means that we become learners. I've said this before. When I graduated high school, I said to myself, I'm never reading another book in my life. And then I got to college. I'm like, oh boy, I got to read a lot of books. And then I left college and I'm like, all right, I'm done. But then I realized I picked the wrong profession. I got to be reading all the time. I got to be learning. And the bottom line is when we come to be a follower of Jesus, we are to become disciples. Disciples are learners. Disciples are committed to a process. Disciples are not just saying, I did it once and I'm done. We commit ourselves to a learning process. And here's the question that I want us to contemplate this morning. How teachable are we? How teachable are we? If we're true disciples, we're committed to the process of learning consistently. We're always listening to God. We're always pursuing him. We're always trying to gain our in knowledge and grow in our understanding. And if we're not committed to learning, we're not committed to growing. How teachable are we? Sometimes some people have great potential and great opportunities before them, yet the fact that they do not humble themselves and become teachable robs them of a lot of possible opportunities. Many doors close. How teachable are we? Lastly, verse 29, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I want you to think back to this, to the, to the yoke that you saw earlier. See, there's an invitation in this passage. There's a simple challenge, a, pre, a challenging prescription that God is giving his people. But then there's a reward. There's a blessing. There is a benefit. There's a pleasant outcome in this whole thing. And if you think back to the oxen once more, the younger ox benefited in one more way. On top of just getting direction and knowing where to go, what to do. Not being clueless about what is happening around him, but feeling he's contributing. He knows what is happening. He's part of the process. On top of all that, he also experiences one more benefit and blessing. And that's the reward of a lighter burden. A lighter burden. As long as the younger ox stays in step with the older one, he shouldn't and will not feel the weight of what he's carrying. He would not feel the burden of it because the older ox, his shoulders are bigger. His muscles are stronger. And so he catches the majority of it. And when that younger ox is moving alongside, he's like, man, working is not that bad. You know, I can do this all day. Well, he doesn't know that the other guy is carrying the majority of the work. He's carrying the biggest burden. So I want you to think about it like this. How many of you ride bikes or have ever ridden a bike before? You've ridden a bike. Awesome. Think about when you were riding a bike. Was it funner to go downhill or uphill? Down. Hallelujah. Gravity is our friend. And so I bought a bike a little while ago, and before we moved to Marlboro, I used to sometimes ride my bike to church. I would ride it to work. So why? Because from my house in Framingham, it would take me about 35 minutes driving to get here in Framingham. And yet, when I rode my bike, it would take me 30 minutes. One day, it took me 24 minutes. So it was faster to ride my bike. Well, on my route, as I'm coming, the quickest route to get here, I had to go over two bridges, Route 9 and 27, and then I had to cross over the Mass Pike right over here on 30. And boy, I hated those parts of my route because I had to go up the bridge. And it doesn't seem like it's a humongous, steep bridge, but boy, when you are flying... You know, I was trying to get here as fast as I possibly could. Any little incline, and you start feeling it. And by the time I'm going, I'm, I get to that bridge, my leg muscles are screaming, saying, no, I'm not, I'm not a pro like Sergio. Sergio, you're good at biking. I'm not, man. My legs were screaming. Now, imagine as I got to the hill, and I'm trying to go up, 
a car pulled over and a driver says, hey, you know what? Let me give you a hand. Here's a rope. Tie it to your bike and I'll tow you up the hill. Now, how easy would that be? That would be awesome. I'll take that every day. Whoever wants to come, I'll be riding my bike next week. I'll tell you the time. I'll meet you there. Thank you very much. Bring the rope. Here's the significance of the yoke illustration. The significance is in its design. If you look at it, go back to, the, go back to that picture real quick, if you can find it. There is a huge beam coming across, and it's going on both of the oxen. And that beam is tied to a perpendicular beam of wood. You see it right in the middle, the round wood there. Now, if you were to take that yoke and you were to lift it up upright, what would you see as a side profile? A cross. See, the design of the yoke is what's so significant in this illustration. What Jesus is saying, I want you to take up my yoke. He's saying, I want you to take up my cross. I want you to take up my cross because once you lift that thing up, you see a cross and it's perfect because Jesus himself bore a cross for us. And on that cross, he took the heaviest burden of all. And he says, you have no weight to carry because at my yoke, at my cross, I carry it all for you. And so my burden is easy. Amen. The scriptures encourage us to cast all of our cares upon Jesus who cares for us. When we come to Jesus and pray about those burdens, we're really saying, Jesus, I want to come under your yoke. I want to come under your protection, under your cross. Paul says that the peace of God that surpasses all understanding can guard our hearts and minds in Christ. The kind of rest that Jesus offers us, I want you to understand. As you get ready for the holiday season and you're looking at everything happening in your life and the different seasons that you might experience, Jesus says, come to me all. I will give you rest. What rest is he promising us? The kind of rest is not the relief from the tasks necessary to sustain us from every day. Or even the freedom from all of life's trials. I I know that's not the case. How many of us got some problems? If you care to admit it. See, those early disciples who took up his cross, he says, hey, follow me. Come and follow me. They didn't just receive a complete pass at everything they had to do. They didn't have to just say, I'm going to sit here on cruise control. Jesus got my life under wraps. And I'll just cruise on through. They didn't experience life without challenges and problems, without struggles. No, as a matter of fact, look at the example of the Apostle Paul. See, the Apostle Paul was very, very proud at the fact that he would tell his churches, I have paid for my own I have worked for myself. He was a tent maker by profession. And he had to work in order to sustain himself. And he did so because he didn't want to burden the churches that were just starting and fledgling. He didn't want to say, hey, on top of that, you take care of me. He took care of himself. So he worked. So Jesus is not promising us a life without work. So some of you, I just, I just burst your bubble. Just kidding. And he's not promising us a life full you know, without troubles. Look at the Apostle Paul one more time. Didn't he tell us? Twice I was almost stoned to death. Stoned, you know, today marijuana is legal. He's not talking about that. He's talking about rocks being thrown at him, okay, and almost killing him. Twice. He was shipwrecked. He was bitten by a venomous viper. He was run out of town. He was spoken against he was persecuted his life was full of issues yet he says the peace that surpasses all understanding will guard the hearts and minds in christ for me to live is christ and to die is gain paul knew that there was going to be troubles anxieties and issues in this life see the kind of rest that jesus offers us It's the kind of rest that accompanies us throughout life. It's the kind of rest that rescues us from self-made anxieties and stresses. It's the rest in mind and the rest that enables a worker to go back to work with a renewed vigor. How many of you guys have gone to work and although the world might be busy and chaotic around you, there is something inside of you that just makes you work with so much more tenacity. 
You know, you might not have it all together, but it's you, you come to work with a new vigor, with a new encouragement. Even the unavoidable work of meeting basic needs is made less tiring by the reassurance that the Savior is right there with you. He's looking after us. I was, I was listening to somebody, I don't even remember who it was, but they were saying, you know what got me through the day today? Thinking about heaven. See, there's a reassurance, no matter how tired and how issue, whatever is going on, when Jesus Christ, when we take up his cross, when we have his promises, we have the reward that, you know what, it's going to be okay. It's going to be fine no matter what's going on. Eventually, everything's going to work out. If we're experiencing chronic fatigue, if we're consistently burdened, I wonder, are we carrying the wrong load? Just ask yourself that question. Am I carrying something I was never intended to carry? Cast your cares upon him, and he will sustain you, Psalms 55. Could it be that we're carrying something that Jesus Christ says, just turn it over to me? So this morning, as we, as we wrap up our time together, it's a very simple promise. Very simple. Come to me. I can do it. It's a challenge because we think of coming and resting as a time of just chilling and not doing anything, yet Jesus says, I got a new job for you. Take up my yoke. I got a new responsibility for you. I want you to partner with me. And if you partner with me, we will carry this cross together. I got the heavy end, you got the light end, and you know what? We will make it happen. And then on top of that, we know that his rest is light and we can, we can rest in it. We can have what is the ultimate gift, the ultimate reward, and that is peace. There's a peace that surpasses all understanding. See, people put themselves in all kinds of burdens. Worship team, you can come up. People wear all kinds of yokes today. I want you to stop and take inventory of your life. Some are slaves to ambition, and that's the yoke that drives them. I always got to get more. I got to have mine. I'm going to accomplish these dreams. It's going to happen. And that yoke drives them day in and day out. Some, it's the yoke of greed. I'm going to make the most I can possibly make. I'm going to have a bigger house. I'm going to have a bigger, better vacation. I'm going to do it even bigger and better. It's going to be the best. Some of us is the yoke of materialism. And I stop and I consider, you know, when we, when we take people over on mission trips, and when we were over in Italy this last year, I was noticing how some of the people that we encountered were more joyful than some of the people that we know here in the States. And they had a lot less. They were going through a lot worse. And yet there was that peace because you know what? God offers a lighter burden. Our perspective. Some of us are yoked to lust. Others to alcohol. Others to pride and all other evils. And we can look at so many different things. And these are the things that truly will exhaust us. These are the things that will truly make us exhausted and tired. That at the end of the day, we'll be like, I can't go on. I can't move forward. Christmas, Thanksgiving, this, that, whatever, and what the world has determined it to be, what we have made it so consumeristic. It's like, it's too much. It's too overwhelming. I'm too tired. By placing ourselves under the yoke of Jesus, there's a promise. Come to me. I'll give you rest. I'll give you peace. I'll fill you up. If you come to me, I'm humble. I'm gentle. If you come to me, your lives are going to be liberated from the exhaustion. And you know what? Even though you'll have troubles, even though you'll have difficulties, even though you're experiencing all this stuff, I'm with you. I got peace for you. And the biggest blessing that I see is that on top of the peace that we get, when we yoke ourselves up with Jesus, it's like I told you last week, we start connecting with calling. And when we connect with calling, we start knowing that we're in the center of God's will. And there's nothing better than knowing that you're in the center of what God has decided and determined and purposed you to be. For you to go, for you to become. There is nothing better. And you know what? You will face the challenges, you will face the issues, the struggles with your heart full of vigor, full of excitement, full of anticipation. Why? Because you know I'm exactly where I need to be. I'm with him. He is leading me. He is guiding me. 
there was a class uh, picture happening in a second grade school, uh, school classroom. And as the man is taking pictures with each of the kids for the portraits, he starts making conversation with the little kids. And he asks one little girl, he says, what are you going to be when you grow up? She looks at him and she gives him one word. She says, tired. <laughs> second grade. That's not the promise that Jesus has for us. When we come to him as little children and he says, all come to me. I am humble. I am meek. I am mild. I will give you rest. So when someone asks you, what are you going to be? It's like, I don't know what it is, but I know that I'm going to be resting in God's arms. No matter who it is, no matter where he leads me, I will be at rest because I'll be with my master. Amen. So this morning, I want us to stand real quick and we're going to partake of communion. Before we do that, I want you to just close your eyes for just a second. Jesus is willing to take your heavy burden this morning. Some of us have never experienced that, never encountered that before. It's like a weight. When we come to the cross, this weight just falls off of us. And there is just hope. There's this lightness about it. He's willing to take your heavy burden and give you something in exchange that is so much lighter, so much better. If this morning you're carrying a heavy burden and you're severely, severely tired, you're fatigued beyond belief, would you please leave whatever you're carrying at the foot of the cross? Leave it on his yoke. We're going to partake of communion in a second, and that, that is a humongous, beautiful picture of people who have said, I will be yoked to Jesus. If there's anyone here today who's burdened because of the sins that you've encountered, because of the failings that you feel like you've encountered in your life, the things that you know, I need to atone for these things. If there are people here who say, I, I feel like I'm not truly a child of God. I, I don't know what that means. I haven't encountered that yet. If your failures and your burdens have just added more and more weight, if, if people have put the weight of religion on you and said you got to do this rule and that rule and all that, that's all you think about when it comes to, to hope and to, and to salvation, I want you today to just pray a prayer with me. It's very simple. I want to pray that right now you're going to leave all these false ideas, all these worries, all these issues, all these sins, all these challenges at the foot of the cross and you're going to just say, Jesus, I need you today. If you've never invited him to have control over your heart and your life, to say, I'm the one who's going to lead, you're going to follow, then today is your day. So with every eye closed in here, I want to just ask you, if that's you, I want you to lift up your hand and I just want to pray a prayer with you. I want to include you in my prayer. If there's anybody here that says, I, I need to change something. I'm tired of being tired with these sins, with these challenges of falling short. I need God to renew my heart. Amen. God bless you, man. Father, I thank you for your promise. It doesn't give us the how and the when. But Lord Jesus, it gives us you. The who of all creation. The who that sustains all things. The who that knew us, Lord God, before we were in our mother's wombs. And Lord, the one who has called us with plans and purposes. You are the invitation. So God, I pray right now for my sister. I pray, Lord God, for anybody else in this place who feels like they have been under the yoke of bondage and sin and slavery, Lord God, of fear of, of all these things that have just idolatry. Whatever has brought us away from you, God, right now in this moment, I declare that you are sovereign, that you are higher, that you are greater, that your shoulders are ample. That your shoulders, Lord God, are stronger to take every burden, every sin, every care, every worry. And that you cast it into the sea of forgetfulness. You give, Lord God, your forgiveness. You give, Lord Jesus, your hope and your future to your children. So God, I thank you that there are people being made right with you today. There are lives being renewed today. And there, Lord God, is hope being established today. 
in Jesus' name, you died for us so that we would be free of sin. And Lord, we accept that what that blood has purchased, salvation for our hearts and souls, and that, Lord, we will be with you forever because of your sacrifice. Jesus, we turn to you as Savior. Help us live with you as the Lord of our lives. And all of God's people said, Amen.